I'm David Grisham, uh, former police chief here in New Albany. Uh, I was born and raised here, lived here all my life. Grew up here, went to school here, uh, graduated in 1970. Um, back then, they had what they call career day at school. And uh, in 69, when I was a junior, we had career day at high school. We had doctors and lawyers and businessmen and different folks come speak to us. And that particular day, we had an FBI agent that came and spoke. And, uh, that's kind of what got me into law enforcement. Uh, he was a really nice, uh, young, nice looking fellow, dressed up, had a three-piece tan suit on and a double Windsor tie. I thought he was just the sharpest thing in the world. And he made a, a nice talk about how important law enforcement was and uh, that if you didn't have safety, if people wasn't secure, that, uh, you know, you had nothing. And it kind of got me to thinking about uh, what I wanted to do, and, and I decided then to pursue a career in law enforcement, and uh, I did. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to Northeast Junior College on a football scholarship, and uh, after that, I went to Ole Miss and graduated with a degree in criminal justice. And uh, back at that time, Richard Nixon was president, and he had a, a grant program for people in law enforcement, pay for your education, pay for everything. It was a great deal. It's the only, re only way I could have probably went to uh, Ole Miss was on a grant like that. And you paid it back by serving uh, so long in law enforcement. So that's what I did. And uh, started work here at the uh, Union County Sheriff's Office in 1973 and worked there for about eight years. And then I was elected police chief in 1981. And that's uh, where I started my career. I worked under two sheriffs, Joe Bryan and Wayne Gaines. Both of them were wonderful people, just great law enforcement officers, uh, had a real good background in law enforcement and, and taught me a lot. I learned a lot more from them uh, than I did during my school for law enforcement. So, I was very fortunate to be able to work under two sheriffs like those. The main difference then was I think people respected the law. Uh, I won't say people were scared of the law, but if you were doing something wrong, you, you were afraid. Uh, there was that, uh, you know, you didn't want to get caught because you needed to go to jail. You knew you'd be punished. And we've kind of gotten away from that now. Uh, I think that's, and a lot of change as far as equipment, uh, a lot better support uh, now than we used to have. Uh, but the, the, the biggest change is people just don't respect the law anymore. At first I was just a deputy sheriff and uh, when Wayne Gaines got elected sheriff and probably 76 maybe. Uh, I became chief deputy then and I served in that office until I was elected police chief in 81. So what's the, what was the role then of a deputy sheriff? Oh, it was a, a lot different from a, a police officer. Of course, you had the jail there that you had to maintain the jail, run the jail. And you had just a bigger area. Of course, the county was 400 plus square miles that you had to patrol and take care of and kind of, you know, accidents and various things. And then you had the court system, circuit court, chancery court. You had to deal with that and you had the mental patients. Uh, you had to transport them to Jackson, to Whitfield. And there's a lot wider range of duties than the police is more confined to, of course, a smaller area. More people, but a smaller area. Uh, they have to handle most all of the circuit and chancery court uh, affairs are handled through the sheriff's office. And uh, of course, the court meets now quite often every couple of months and uh, transporting prisoners back and forth. And 
And operating the jail, that's a huge, huge responsibility. It takes a lot of people, costs a lot. And that's a lot of duties that uh, city police, you know, don't have to do. We take our prisoners, or did take our prisoners to the county and they housed them for us. And the county jail, when you started, where was it located? It was located there behind the courthouse, uh, between Main and Bankhead Street. Uh, it served the jail there for ever. <laughs> was your office there? Yes, that's the sheriff's office was in the jail. Actually, when I started to work in 1973, the sheriff lived in the jail. Joe Bryant lived in the jail. The bottom section of the jail was where him and his family lived. Did you ever have to live in the jail? I did not. Uh, they stopped that in the uh, late 70s sometime. Uh, they moved out and started having someone that a deputy stayed there at night, or someone did. I grew up here in New Albany. Uh, my dad was friends with uh, some of the policemen. Uh, my dad worked at the funeral home, and, and he knew some of the policemen, and I kind of got to know them through them, and uh, got to be friends with them. And uh, I always just kind of admired uh, policemen, law enforcement. Uh, and, and I didn't think a whole lot about it as I got older until that particular day at school. It just kind of, he was so, that FBI agent was so impressive. Not but just the way he looked, but his, his talk was so impressive. His demeanor was so good and he was, seemed to be so sincere about uh, law enforcement. It just kind of stuck with me and Never wanted to do anything else. Well, back then, of course, it was, there was three deputies and the sheriff. And that was pretty much it. And you just, uh, you know, like I said, the county was so big that, uh, you know, it'd take you 40, 45 minutes to go from one side of the county to the other. And, uh, there was three deputies and you just kind of, you know, there wasn't really a Monday through Friday or you just worked, you know, and then you go home at night and you were on call or something happened at night, they'd call you and you'd have to get up and, and, and go, you know. Uh, it was a lot different than uh, the city police work, a lot different. Did the city police have more? Employees. They had more, uh, not near as many as now, but, but they did have a lot more than we did. Yes. Um, do you remember the first uh, patrol car that you drove? I do. What was it? It was a 1972 Ford. Back then they were called Galaxies, I think. It was a Ford Galaxy, I believe. And it was just a plain car. I mean, it didn't have, it didn't have anything on it. It was just a and then, of course, power windows. It didn't have any of that. It was just a plain, plain car. With just a, a logo on the side of it? With a sticker on sticker the side. On the side. Yeah. And a light, a blue light on top? Back then, they had round uh, lights that sit up in the middle of the roof, top of your car. And they were just kind of around. They looked like a bubblegum machine. Kind of. <laughs> on, on the outside. On, on the top. outside, yeah. yes. No, we had different nights. We weren't on call every night. We kind of shared the, the calls at night. But the nights you were on call, especially on the weekend, uh, yeah, you're going to get called out. I mean, I wouldn't doubt about it. Probably domestic disturbances were probably the most common. Uh, a lot of alcohol related. Uh, of course, back then, you know, alcohol wasn't legal. A lot of people had a real low tolerance to alcohol, thought it was the worst thing in the world. And, and it did cause a lot of problems. And uh, mostly domestic and alcohol related. Oh yeah, that was a big deal back then. Uh, some in the county, probably a little more in the city maybe. Uh, but yeah, there was always bootleggers. That was a pretty common thing, you know, cause there wasn't any 
back then you had to go to Tupelo was the closest place to get alcohol. And um, back in, in those days in the 70s, a lot of people didn't have cars. You know, they, they, they didn't have vehicles to go to Tupelo or Holly Springs or wherever. Uh, so that was, a, I think, a reason there was a more demand for bootlegging here in town. They would go to Tupelo or, or maybe Holly Springs or uh, some of them went up the edge of Tennessee and they would, you know, buy, most bootleggers sold liquor by the half, what we call half pints, small bottles. And they'd buy it by the case and come back here and set it. It was a little harder bootlegging beer because it took up more space. It wasn't as easily concealed as uh, liquor was the main bootleg item back in those days. It, it could be a felony uh, if you were convicted multiple times of bootlegging. It, some people actually went to prison over bootlegging. That's a long time, long time ago. Wasn't, wasn't usual, but there was a couple instances where people that had been caught multiple times did have to go to prison. Did you ever think that alcohol would be legal in Union County? I really did. Well, I thought it probably would someday, but not during my tenure as police chief. I was uh, shocked that it was uh, legalized before I went out of office. I'll have to admit it, yes. I think one of the worst crimes is burglary of a dwelling. In other words, burglary of someone's home where they live, where their families live, their precious items are kept. Uh, to me, that's one of the worst offenses that we had. And we, we, we used to have a lot of that. It was uh, out in the county back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, it was just a it was a real problem of people would come in from Lee County, Prentice County, other areas and and break into folks' houses during the daytime while they were at work. You know, they'd come to your house and knock on the door. Nobody came to the door. They didn't think anybody was there. They'd break in. You know, they'd steal your guns, your electronics, your jewelry, money, whatever you had. And that, you know, to me, that's just a you know, when you come home and find out that your home's been broken into and your valuables are gone and, and a lot of your keepsakes, uh, to me, that's one of the worst crimes we had. The first thing you do, once you determine what's missing, is you've got to try to find some of the merchandise. Uh, most house burglaries, they always take guns especially out in the county. Most everybody that lives out in the country has some type of weapons, whether it be a handgun or a long gun, shotgun rifle or something. And, uh, you know, you just got to try to find the merchandise, try to track the merchandise down. And sometimes they'd go to pawn shops and sell it in other cities, not here, but in Tupelo or uh, somewhere. And, um, that was kind of the first thing you do is try to run down some of the merchandise. Because, you know, back then there wasn't a, like you said, there wasn't a whole lot of technology. Uh, we, we did do some fingerprints back then, uh, but not near to the degree, you know, which it is now. The first really big multiple homicide I ever seen was in the early 70s out in the East Union community. Uh, a guy broke into his former wife's house and killed his two kids and shot her. And uh, these children were like six and eight years old. They were, you know, they were in the bed asleep. He shot them in the bed and killed them while they were asleep. And that, that was the first big real horrific homicide that I ever seen. And of course, later on as police chief, we had several through the years. Um, uh, of course, uh, Coach Price's wife, uh, that was a terrible, terrible, happened 
kind of during the holiday season. They were in the bed with their small child watching a movie at night. A guy broke into the house and she had got up to go in the kitchen to get a drink of water and get something and surprised him and he shot her and killed her. Uh, and then the Chico Foot homicide here in town was probably the worst one I ever had. Um, a guy him and his girlfriend was sitting in the car talking. They'd been out on a date. They got in an argument, and he shot her in the car. And he got out of the car, and there was a dwelling house there where they were parked at. And he went in the house and shot two individuals, which was her family, some of her family members, shot two of them. And he left on foot and went to Mr. Chico Foote's house, killed his wife, and then when he came home from work, he killed Mr. Foote, shot him in the head and killed him. So he killed three people and shot another one that night. And uh, that was probably the worst one we ever had for us, multiple victims here in town. And this was a long, long, long time ago. There was a homicide out at the Junior Food Mart on uh, West Bankhead Street where a guy went in and shot the attendant and killed him, robbed the store, got the money. Left and uh, he's never even had any indication of who it was or what happened. That's, it's been 40 years ago. Where was the Junior Food Mart on West Bank Head? Uh, it was just past uh, where Maxi Motor Company is now on the left there. It's kind of up on the hill. It was the first convenience store here in New Albany. A gentleman named Mr. Ritter had two. There was one downtown uh, on Bankhead Street where Palachi uh, Gourmet has a place there. He had one there and then one out on the West Bank Head. When I started, the vast, vast majority of residents here in New Albany and Union County actually adored law enforcement. Loved them. I mean, they, they used to bring stuff to the office, you know, cakes and pies and just all kind of, you know. You had a very, very small percent of your population that were in the criminal activity. You know, 98% of the people never dared thinking about doing something like that back then. Now, as time went on up through, after I got elected police chief, up in the 90s and early 2000s, kind of changed a little bit, you know, uh, just didn't feel like you were supported by the general public quite as much as you used to be. Uh, just didn't seem to didn't seem to be respected like like you were back in the seventies and eighties. What do you think changed that? I don't know. I think society has just kind of changed somewhat as a whole. Um, I, I don't know. It's a lot of single parent families, uh, I think it's got a lot to do with it. You see the majority of your criminals seem to come from either one or no parent families or, you know, just didn't have the right atmosphere at home and just didn't, you know, grew up in a bad situation. That's just kind of a, a breeding point for, for criminal activity. Plus, being able to help folks. I mean, that that's what you're there for. And if you, if you don't have a desire to do that, you're not going to be successful. Uh, you know, I want my family to be safe and I want your family to be safe. And uh, that's, you know, that's our job. That's what I want to do. I want to make you all the best small town it could possibly be. 
and uh, law enforcement has a lot of rewarding uh, opportunities, a lot of sad situations, uh, a lot of tough situations, but a lot of rewarding things when you can help somebody, when you when you're able to uh, solve someone's burglary, to get their personal belongings back, their jewelry, their mementos, or something that's handed down uh, from their family. You know, when you're able to do something like that, it is very rewarding. And uh, you know, that's that's what we're here to do. I did not. I got close a few times, but uh, luckily I was able to get them to the ER before it happened. <laughs> When I worked at the sheriff's office back in the mid 70s, I guess, got a call one morning at home uh, that there was a baby out on uh, Beacon Hill at the truck stop laying in front of the door. Well, I thought it was a fake call. You got a lot of those back in them days. But I did, it was just about daylight that morning. I got up and went out there and sure enough, pulled up there and there was a, an infant, I mean, just a two or three month old baby laying there in front of me. And uh, that was, to me, that was one of the strangest things I'd ever seen. I, I didn't have any children at the time. That was early, early on. And so, what am I gonna do with this baby? You know? So I got it and brought it to the jail and Sheriff wife took care of it <laughs> until <laughs> until the welfare could come get it. But that, that was one of the strangest calls I think I ever had. Wow. Law enforcement has changed through the years, computers. Um, I know when I got elected police chief in 81, I got the, our first computer at the police department. Uh, it was called an NCIC machine. It gave you the ability to communicate by computer with other police departments all around the all around the country and you could you know check your stolen items vehicles guns and things like that and and that really began to change law enforcement when technology really got involved and um, later on before I went office they even got uh, you know computers in the patrol cars you know, and back in the 70s, you would have never dreamed of that. I mean, never even thought about it, never heard anything about a computer, you know. But it's changed a lot over the years. We had a two-way radio in the car that we could communicate from the car to the jail. Had someone there at the jail that operated the radio. No, we didn't have cell phones, you know. You just, like I said, they'd call you at home if, if you were, you. You had to tell them where you, if you're going to be at home, you'd tell uh, the office where you're going to be, and they'd call you by landline, and uh, that was it. I remember when we got our first cell phone at the city. I can't remember exactly what year it was, but I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. When we had a, had a, it was called a bag phone back then. You're not old enough to remember that, but. Uh, had it in our car and, and it actually worked pretty good. Um, I just, I thought that was the greatest thing it ever was. <laughs> you could always be reached. Yeah, I mean, they could get up. Well, we had pagers first and that, we had those for a few years, but when the, the bag phones and then the Nokia phones or had a little stand in your car that went on, <coughs> that was a real benefit to law enforcement, tremendous benefit. I mean, it gave you so much more, you know, communication ability. Did you use pay phones some? Uh, yeah. You know, there might be a sensitive matter that, of course, there were scan. You know, people had scanners and things even back in those days. And you know, if it was something you didn't want everybody to know, yeah, you had to go somewhere and use the phone to call. Yeah. Well, now, back early at the sheriff's office days. Uh, Sheriff's wife was a dispatcher. Actually, Joe Bryant's wife, Martha, wonderful woman. Uh, she was pretty well, you know, she was pretty much a dispatcher. Even day and night, she lived there and stayed there all the time. And did a great job. Uh, later on now, is like when I became police chief, yeah, we had uh, uh, dispatchers at night, you know, that, that 
manned the phones and radios and all. Yeah. Well, Merle was police chief when I was growing up, going to high school here. Knew him really well. My dad and him were friends. Uh, he had a, a uh, daughter that was close to my brother's age. It was friends with my brother, knew him. And I knew him for a long time. You know, he was, I don't know, I don't remember how long he was police chief. Mr. Lonnie McCarran was the first police chief I remember when I was a child. But Murr was in office several years before I got elected. Jim Hines was sheriff. I knew him pretty well through my dad. Uh, they actually lived fairly close to us here in town. And I remember him as uh, sheriff. I don't know, he was sheriff in the early 60s. Did you ever lose any friends over? Oh yeah, quite a few, yeah. Uh, people tend to take advantage of you, uh, try to use you, you know, and, and lost some through the years. I always kind of felt like they weren't too good of friends if they got mad over something like that. <laughs> I felt like I was lucky. I was raised by good parents, had a good family. I had an older brother that was a good role model for me. and. Uh, I just, I was lucky enough to decide early what I wanted to do. I never had any regrets, never said, oh, I wish I'd have been a coach or, or a, a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever, you know. I, that never did enter my mind. Uh, I did 40 years what I wanted to do, what I enjoyed to do, and, and I never really looked at it as a job. I just didn't feel like it was a job. It was just something I enjoyed doing so much and uh, you know wouldn't change a thing if I had it to do over. I was very fortunate you know I, I, I've always told everybody I was always lucky. Had a good wife to start with that supported me. I had three good children that didn't cause me any problems. Three daughters that were all uh, good kids, went to school, got good education. So, turned out to be good productive citizens, so kind of feel like I've done my part. Law enforcement police officers are kind of similar to lawyers. Most people don't like lawyers unless you get in trouble and you need one. And then you go, the first thing you do is go call a lawyer. Well, policemen is kind of the same way. You know, most people don't want a policeman bothering them, don't want them stopping them if you're going a little too fast or if you roll through a stop sign or something. They don't want you fooling with them. But when something bad happens to them, that's the first thing they do is run call the police. And it, you know, like I said, society can't, can't function without them. And sometimes police get the wrong, uh, people get the wrong impression of police officers. You know, they think they're lazy. They, stay at the coffee shop too much and they don't do what they should do and you know we, we expect our police officers now to be social workers lawyers you know we expect them to do so many different things but yet we don't want to pay them you know what they should be paid they're tremendously underpaid and they just kind of get a, a bad rap sometimes you know and that's why it's so hard to try to prove to the general public that you, you know, you're there to do a job, you want to do a job, and sometimes you have to do unpleasant things. You know, I, I never did like putting somebody in jail, particularly, but it's just something you had to do. That's part of it. And uh, that's the only way we can, there's always gonna be criminals, there's always gonna be people, be people that break the law but we've got to hold it down to a smaller number as we can. And then that's the only way that, you know, society can be safe and live in a free society. Of course, it's a bad time for law enforcement right now. Really bad time. Worst it's ever been in the 40 some odd years that I've been dealing with it. It's tough. It's tough right now.
you know, it's just kind of a product of the times. That it's kind of like a, a pendulum. It'll swing back the other way at some point in time, hopefully sooner than later. Uh, but the general public really needs to support our law enforcement right now. They need it more than ever. They really do.